Okay. All right. After some inevitable technical snafus, uh, we are officially starting our NCSA National Gra Grassroots Network launch meeting. Um, and welcome everybody. And thank you for bearing with us as we got this started. Um, my name is Jill Escher. I am one of your hosts tonight. Um, I'd like to also introduce um, the coordinator of the NGN. Um, Leanne, would you like to introduce yourself? A word? Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm Leanne Bloor Morfitt, and I am uh, coming to you from Syracuse, upstate New York. So, welcome. And I am coming to you from San Jose, California. I just got home literally minutes ago. Um, so, I'm a little bit discombobulated. Um, but uh, we have two other guests this evening. We have two members of our board. Amy, want to say hi? Amy Letts, our vice president, and um, Gloria Satriale, who is um, a cherished member of our board. So welcome, everyone. Um, this meeting is going to take about an hour. Um, the purpose of it is really just to get this grassroots network off the ground um, by us kind of explaining what it's all about. Um, and of course, hearing back from you. This is just uh, the starting point of what will be a very, very long process um, of developing the NGN and putting it into um, practice. All right, let's see if I can. All right, um, a lot of you are very familiar. I saw some names on the list. Hello to those of you who I know. Um, a lot of you are very familiar with NCSA, some of you probably less so. We are a volunteer run nonprofit um, that pursues recognition, policy and solutions for the surging population of individuals, families and caregivers affected by severe forms of autism and related disorders. People always say, what do you mean by severe autism? Well, I invite you to go to our website under our FAQs. We have a kind of narrative about what we mean um, by severe autism, but it, it fairly overlaps with the definition of profound autism, which um, was recently introduced um, by the Lancet Commission. And it basically means that population with autism that really requires you kind of constant supervision and has a very low level of adaptive skills. Some of them have um, challenged behaviors, some of them don't, um, but it really comes down to adaptive functioning. Um, what is the NGN? The National Grassroots Network is a volunteer group that will actively promote awareness, practices, and policies that benefit our population. And people say, well, what's the time commitment? You know, I, I think we're, we're guessing it will be, you know, one to five hours a month. And most of that time will be probably just on emails going back and forth. Um, and, um, you know, it's different because NCSA has had some committees before, but the NGN is different because we're trying to span the whole country. We're trying to span all the congressional districts. We're trying to be much broader than we were before. So this is a very significant step for NCSA. All right, who are you? Well, when, on the intake forms, when people signed up to become part of the network, um, this is what you told us. The vast majority of you are parents of children and adults, mostly young adults. A few people are parents of older adults. Um, with severe profound autism. Um, some other family members, such as grandparents, um, quite a few professionals, physicians, psychiatrists, therapists, teachers, um, research, even researchers, which was really cool. Um, friends who just have an interest um, in this area or you know, who have you know, friends with uh, children with severe autism and also individuals with autism. So that's great. Leanne, I'm going to turn it over to you for this slide. So we were able to um, get your addresses and create this uh, nifty little map here. And you can kind of see the, the coverage that we have. Been, this is literally a pin per um, person. And it, it kind of shows you, um, you know, where everybody's located. Um, and some of the sparse spots. So you'll probably notice that um, that kind of um, area, uh, the band right in between the East Coast and the West Coast is a little bit, 
little bit more sparse. Um, and so I, I think nonetheless, though, it's still very exciting because I see a lot of red dots there. So um, we do cover um, almost almost all of the country at this point. A uh, few uh, people from uh, United States territories even um, have, uh, you know, they're interested. Um, we've even had a few people from outside of the country just say, hey, you know, we, we want to see what you're doing too. So um, I think this is really important because in a grassroots network, you know, one of the things we're going to be trying to do is to contact our, our representatives. So um, to me, I feel like for the amount of time that we, we have the setup, we have a really great start. Um, at getting some of that initial coverage um, that we're going to need to contact each of the each of the representatives. So, um, if we want to take a look at the next slide, yeah, I agree. It's it's a great start, and I'm a hundred percent confident um, that we will see more red dots um, before long. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Go ahead, Leanne. Um, so as you can see, we do have 44 states represented and uh, we're missing coverage for these states here. So um, Alaska, Hawaii, Iowa, Montana, Nevada, and Wyoming. So if you got a friend, if you know anyone, um, even if it's um, if if you have someone um, that doesn't have a child or it doesn't isn't a professional, but maybe a relative or a friend who lives in those areas, it doesn't hurt to ask them to help. Uh, with your advocacy efforts and have them contact, um, you know, their uh, their representatives on your behalf too. Um, so we had a question come in about if this is only a federal uh, level project. And I think the intent is to be, we want to be networked so we can support one another at the state levels as well and, and create kind of some um, enclaves that way. So, um, you know, that is the intent is, you know, we want this to be a network. Um, we want this to create connections, relationships amongst all of us, um, talk about what works, what doesn't, where are certain policies good that we can maybe mimic in other states and whatnot. So, um, you know, that is the goal is to create this, um, uh, these separate enclaves for the states. Um, yeah. Is that, Jill, do you have anything yeah, else you I wanted? I just wanted to echo that to say that, you know, what we hope the policy network will do over time is advocate both at the state level and at the national level. So having groups, you know, in each of the states, um, you know, that can collaborate on particular, you know, policies or issues, you know, is definitely a goal. And we, you know, what we're kind of thinking is that we might have these breakout um, groups, you know, per state or whatnot that can kind of meet um, in their own ways and we'll help them facilitate that as well. Um, so if you're a real champion of your particular state, and if you want to let us know that that's something you'd like to champion for us, um, by all means, send us an email and let us know um, that that's something you might be interested in doing, because we are definitely looking for people to take some initiatives that way. Um, that'd be super helpful to have your input that way. Um, well, that here's being... somebody on the chat saying, um, uh, Todd Kopelman, on the call from Iowa. Hello, Iowa. There. <laughs> <laughs> you got another state. Um, okay. Um, can we move on to the next slide? Sure. And just so you see that, we, um, just so people know, um, you know, I'm not sure how familiar people are. Some people might be a little bit more familiar with grassroots um, advocacy than others. So, you know, I think the end goal is we have 435 congressional districts. Um, and we are hoping to get as much coverage over those districts as possible. Right now, um, we have 228 of those congressional districts covered. So, um, you know, that's kind of where we're standing right now. Uh, again, hoping that maybe we can get a little bit more as time goes on. Um, and again, any support that anybody can offer with um, asking friends or spreading the word a little bit, that would be great. So, yeah, go ahead, I'm Jill. Sure we'll, yeah, I'm sure we'll get there too. I mean, yeah. this is just the no, beginning. This is, this is just the beginning. This is, excited. In, my, in my view, this is a great start. It is right? a great I mean, start. Not even off the ground yet. And we're more uh, the, than halfway there. The amount of materials, the amount of legwork and and uh, uh, effort that Jill has personally put in, I can tell you as someone newer to this, um, it's very impressive. It's very exciting as a parent. I am a parent. I just so everybody knows I am a parent. Um, this just brings me a lot of hope of what we can accomplish. So thanks, everybody. All right, moving on. 
All right. So um, what did you guys tell us about um, issues that you're concerned about? Um, you know, one thing that was loud and clear is just the overall service deficit that, you know, for, for serving our particular population, a lot of people said you know, the system is broken, um, that the dominant narratives about autism exclude children and clients like ours. And so there's a big um, need that you know, came across in what you told us about educating people about realities of severe autism and that it's not the quirky genius, you know, and it's not, you know, the easy, not necessarily, you know, the easygoing um, individual. Um, let's see, people are raising their hands. So I think we're gonna, I don't know how we're gonna handle the chat, but let me get through this slide. Um, uh, you also told us that the voiceless need others um, to advocate for them and that those voices should be those who know them best and love them most and care most about them. Um, very many people complained about other autism organizations. I, I've been involved in so many autism organizations. I'm not here to complain about, about any of them. Um, but the, your message came across loud and loud and clear that um, you felt that other autism organizations have failed to give voice to this population. Um, and there's also insufficient focus on the long-term care crisis. A lot of people said, you know, I need to be able to die, right? And, and know that my child um, has care. Um, and um, concerns that many recent policies have been counterproductive. Of course, you told us more than this. These are just some of the, some of the highlights. Amy did, and Gloria, did you want to comment on anything? Not yet. I mean, you've got it really covered. I think that, you know, uh, I saw in the chat, can you tell us what congressional districts are covered and which ones are not? Um, frankly, for a launch to have almost 50% of the congressional yeah yeah right um over 50 percent it's really huge so this is just the uh, the initial launch and we're going to be able to organize in a way that um brings each and every one of these states as well as the federal level to um you know hear our voice in a way that it hasn't heard before so right now you're just kind of like laying the baseline of where we are and then you know we'll get to the action items of what we need to do um, great. Amy, did you have any comments about? No, I'm just, I'm here mostly, as I said, to learn also. I'm just getting involved in a lot of state advocacy recently um, on my own. So in I Pennsylvania, think that, I will add. Yeah, in Pennsylvania. And so to speak to the person who said, asked if this was just federal, no, definitely not. And I hope that at some point we'll be able to put out calls when we hear about things and alert like re regional or even individual states that something is happening in their state and kind of mobilize an on the ground kind of like response that might be more localized depending on uh, on the issue at hand. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. We have about 23 slides, people. It's not gonna be overwhelming. We will finish within the hour. All right, so about the meetings, um, by the way, we know that this meeting is impersonal. It's just an introduction. Um, we knew we would not be able to fit everybody into um, Zoom meeting format. So this is in webinar format, but believe me, as we develop, there will be lots more in interaction um, than we're having tonight, lots more faces on the screen. Um, so, um, and then of course, we're gonna have certain meetings about certain topics, right? So then we'll have people who are really focused on a certain issue meeting together, or of course, as we already discussed, um, around certain state issues. And someday maybe we will have, here's my Sophie. Sophie, you wanna say hi? Here, Sophie, here, look at, there she is. That's my my precious princess. Sophie, I'm gonna help you in just a few minutes, okay? Um, she looks like a maybe, total skier. She's a total Well, we skier. just were skiing, so oh. that's, that explains our, 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 our where. Um, anyway, we hopefully, maybe someday we'll do something in person. We might have a conference. Um, you know, that's devoted to the topic of, you know, severe or profound autism. Um, that's certainly, certainly an aspiration. So um, who knows? Now, uh, Leanne, tell us about the NGN Facebook group. Well, it's, it's going to be our way of kind of um, getting to know one another, I think a little bit more personally. Um, so it is uh, active right now. It's a private group. So no one's going to be able to see it. Um, they're not going to be able to search for it within Facebook. Um, we're just going to do that to start. Um, and it, it's going to be a, a place where we can all kind of go and talk about, um, uh, you know, individual 
questions. It is not a support group. So I just want to bring that up because um, it's very easy to, um, you know, get caught up. We are all obviously <laughs> in need of support, um, but we don't want to be um, distracted from what we're trying to accomplish. So we're going to make sure that um, uh, the topics are about advocacy and, and the efforts we're trying to put forth. Um, it is going to be, as I said, private. We do have some rules that are just basic, you know, keep it civil um, and constructive, keep it private. We're going to keep uh, conversations in there. You know, the topics that we talk about are generally, um, you know, they're, they're personal information sometimes about our, our kids, ourselves or whatnot. So we want to make sure that we understand and keep that confidentiality and, um, you know, keep that trust going within the group and understand that our group is dynamic. You know, we're evolving over time. Um, some things that are said today, we might not even agree with in, in six months from now, but so it's going to be dynamic, but it's going to be a great place for us to meet one another um, and, and possibly even create some um, some subgroups right within there. So if you see um, the QR code. On yeah, someone just posted when uh, I go into the QR code, it says content not available now. So uh, what's the other way they can sign up? I mean, I know that doesn't you have I, a link in one of our emails. Yeah. I, I will make sure and send out the link to everybody. So I apologize. Um, I had tested the QR code, but I don't have my phone with me right now to just see what's going on right now. Um, I will make sure that uh, everybody um, gets a copy of the link to the group. Um, and Jill, if you see, I don't know if you can, I think that is a link right within there. If you want to show people the group. Oh, then I have to like stop share and reshare. Ah, but, okay. Never. Yeah, never maybe not. Okay. We will make sure to get yeah. that to you. Um, and uh, it should. What I am asking everybody to do. There will be a few questions. Um, they're just basically. I'm asking everybody to provide your email address. So I'm going to make sure that the people in that group are within our NGN. Um, we have a spreadsheet, uh, a database, um, so to say, speak. So I'm going to make sure that only people who are on our list are getting into that group. Um, so there'll just be a question about filling that out when you do enter the group. So okay. great. Yeah. So look out for that. You know, um, if you're on Facebook, please join. Even if you're not on Facebook, maybe join just for this group. Think about it. Um, we will also be communicating with each other um, via newsletter and emails. So for example, if there, there might be email groups around a certain issue or email groups around a certain state um, and the newsletters, you know, th those will come out from time to time, you know, as, as needed. Um, and then, as I mentioned, this will be a lengthy developing process, you know, don't expect things to happen in a day. Um, this, this is a, a marathon and not a sprint. Okay, rules of the road not too many rules. Um, we're not a secret society at all. It's not like, oh, we're deviously trying to concoct, you know, <laughs> special you know, policy efforts. Um, our intentions will be public. Our final materials will all be public. Um, but please keep the, the content of the meetings confidential. Um, people will be sharing personal information. Um, also, we're going to be engaging in sort of free and open discussion with some not fully formed ideas. And I don't want people going out there saying, well, NCSA said blah, 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 you know, when it was just sort of part of brainstorming or idea de development and something that really hadn't gone to, you know, the board for a vote. I mean, we have a board that's the final say on our policy positions. And if you go to our website, you will see um, our our, our position statements, we have a tab position statements and there are several of them. Those are our, those are the only things that are our official statements. Anything we say is just us blabbing or individual opinions, okay? Um, when we uh, criticize others, we please try to make it constructive, no bullying, obviously no selling of products or services. You know, unfortunately the autism sphere, as you guys all know, is notorious for um, really um, vitriolic uh, rhetoric. And this is just not the place for, for that. We, when, when we criticize, and of course we have a lot to criticize, all of us do, that's why we're here. Um, we do it in a constructive way. Um, participation is vol entirely voluntary. You are not getting paid. Maybe you'll get like a special hat or t-shirt <laughs> or something, um, but you know, you're not getting paid to do this. But I wanna say, 
um, there will be opportunities for compensated work along the way. I can tell you right now, we are gonna need designers. We are gonna need researchers. We are gonna need writers. We're gonna need people who are good with data. We're gonna need people who are good at PR, right? For example, those aren't the only things. So, you know, there may be opportunities to actually have, you know, uh, very kind of discrete, dedicated contract work along the way, but your participation in the NGN is voluntary. Um, are there any questions about any of these rules or any other comments before I go on? Jill, before you take questions, Leanne, mm -hmm. I just clicked on the link and it doesn't work. It go, it says oh, this content Facebook is group not link. available right now. So just, I don't want you to be deluged with observations about that. Thank you very much. <laughs> We will fix that and uh, get back to everybody. <laughs> okay, thank you. It will work. So we're going to get everyone on that. Group. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, advocacy. What what we're about. I mean, NCSA has always been a very pragmatic organization. Um, we're not ideologues. Um, uh, we are looking for policies that are based on reality and common sense and not on kind of fantasies about autism. We believe in accepting our children for who they are, not who we want them to be. And, um, you know, we, we want, we are their voice. We want to do the best we can um, for them. Um, equity is another principle. Severe autism is an underserved community and um, there is a fundamental need to radically expand capacity to serve those with the greatest challenges. Um, Efficiency, uh, childhood and lifespan programs should feature highly efficient use of public funds. Um, call me cheap, but I'm a very strong believer in efficient use of funds. We, we sometimes, in, in my opinion, see, I think, misguided priorities in how we spend um, taxpayer money. And um, this will be an interesting thing to do. Also, as we know, our state and federal representatives hate spending money. They, they hate spending money on disability programs. Let's just say it, they do. And so um, the more efficient we can be, the better. Um, Person-centered, we strongly believe that services must be driven by individual needs and not by abstract ideology or paternalistic ideas. How is it structured? Um, this is a really big deal, people. Um, I am the interim policy chair as the president of NCSA but we do need to appoint a new chair. Now, I'm very certain that we will find a new chair and we'll find a great person. Right now, we don't have a policy chair on our board. Um, the pol so obviously if people out there are interested in that position, um, please contact me and let me know and I'd love to talk to you. Or if you know somebody um, who might be interested, again, contact me. Policy coordinator, as you already know, is Leanne, and thank goodness for her, um, doing all the, the heavy lifting and nuts and bolts behind the scenes. Um, we do have a policy committee. It's been a little quiet lately because we've been sort of focused on getting the NGN off the ground. Um, this policy committee makes recommendations to the NCSA board, and um, we want to add people to this committee, um, and we want to kind of strengthen this committee, so that will be another focus for us moving forward. Obviously, you guys are the National Grassroots Network. You're the heart of this whole effort. We also collaborate with like-minded organizations, um, and, and there are many, and those collaborations hopefully will increase over time. Potential future goals include hiring a lobbyist at the federal level, and um, possibly even getting an executive director for NCSA. But as I said before, NCSA right now is entirely vol volunteer run. Um, you know, getting an executive director will hinge primarily uh, and hiring a lobbyist will hinge primarily on fundraising, which we've been trying to do. Um, and I think we're going to have to do more of it to achieve those future goals. But for right now, um, we are very much volunteer driven. Any other comments on this before we move on to the next slide, ladies? Nope. They're like, okay, Jill, move on. All right. What will you do? Uh, the most important thing is I think like that the NGN now exists, you know, it, nothing like this existed before, right? A really coordinated effort around severe autism. So the fact that we exist and can mobilize is a really big deal. Um, and um, I think it will make NCSA, you know, a stronger organization and make us more relevant to the things that really matter to people. 
Um, now, in terms of kind of advocacy, there are two ways to approach advocacy. The first is kind of reactive, which is where there are pending matters that have been initiated by other organizations, and we take position on those matters, you know, whether we're, we're for or we're against or whether we want to make other comments. And those are don't only, and it's not only at the state and federal level, but also at the, um, you know, in terms of practice and in terms of research. Um, we uh, recently, just for example, um, some members of our board, including myself and Amy, um, we uh, penned a commentary that's going to be published in a major autism journal soon, um, all about um, language use in autism. So that's not a state matter. It's not a federal matter, but it does relate to practice and research. Um, and reactive advocacy, that could mean emails, calls, letters, meetings, you know, Zooms, social media, or even things like I just mentioned, you know, writing a journal article. Um, there are lots of ways to do it. And we will definitely, definitely be calling on the network to do these sorts of things. And this can be at the state level or the federal level. And then the other way to do advocacy, as you guys know, is proactively, where we have a specific agenda and we define the goal and we define the path forward. Now, doing that obviously is a huge effort. And I think none of us want to waste anybody's time. So when we define a proactive advocacy goal, we want to make sure it's fairly achievable. I mean, there are a lot of goals out there in the disability advocacy world, and a lot of them I think are pretty far-fetched. So we, we want to be very realistic. Um, and uh, what we're going to move into now is actually talking about some of these issues, right, that, that are important and that have bubbled up um, over the years. You guys received the NGN backgrounder, the policy backgrounder. Um, this is a stat, what I would consider a static compilation of input from many sources, from our policy committee members, from our board members, from our followers, from researchers, from many, many, many people that um, you know, we've been in, in touch with over the years. It's an eight page document. Um, you have the PDF. If you go to the emails that Leanne has been sending out, you can click and download the PDF. So it's just, it, it's not a strategic plan at all. It's sort of a brain dump. But what it will be over time is a living document that will provide over time more of a roadmap for our advocacy network. But um, there's a lot on our plate. So that's mm -hmm. what we're gonna go to next. <laughs> you, you can see like, um, this is not simple. It's not like, you know, building a bridge from here to there. There's so many, here, there we go. Um, one theme um, that I think is really important to our network is that you know, we see autism as a serious disorder. Um, there has been, as we all know, a very strong and vocal movement to kind of redefine what autism means um, in terms of uh, neurodiversity and neurodivergence, you know, kind of a, a different way of being in the world. Um, that's not how we see it. We see it as a serious uh, neurological or neurobehavioral or neurodevelopmental disorder that compromises higher order cognitive processes, including language, social comprehension, abstract thought, and learning. Um, people with severe autism have impaired ability to engage in activities of daily living. Many have challenging behaviors, including aggression, self-injury, property destruction, and elopement, as well as medical conditions such as seizures. And importantly, due to pervasive functional limitations, these individuals are unable to live independently, they're incapable of earning a living in, in any meaningful way, and they require 24-7 support or close to 24-7 support. Um, and ASD is not just a kind of benign difference. Um, research has really shown, um, especially in recent years, how it's rooted in foundational abnormalities of very early brain development. Um, the way that neurons are born, the way that neurons grow, the way neurons are placed in the cortex, the way they function and the way they connect is different in brains with autism. It's not just a benign um, condition. Um, anything, any comments on this to my, uh, my fellow panelists? No, my fellow panelists have nothing to say on this. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I think it's a it's a webinar in in and of itself, right, Jill? It's that, a webinar. Yeah, each one of these yeah. is right. Right. So there's so much to say, and so much that you've you know kind of bullet pointed the you know primary considerations is a good thing, but we can't get down into the weeds of the neurodivergence challenges. I was just sitting on a dissertation committee today where they wanted to change ASD to autism. Uh, notwithstanding its designation in the DSM-5, because it would offend the neurodiversity community. Insane. So yeah. that's another topic for another day. Yeah, I mean, listen, there are 5 million fires to put out. I mean, I know it's, it's very hard. Um, let's see. Now, Christine says, I checked my emails. I didn't receive the eight-page document, um, the policy background are yeah, it, it was embedded in, in a link um, announcing this meeting, but we will make sure that it is maybe an updated version is linked in, in a following email. So don't worry about it, people. And eventually it'll go on our website, too. Again, it's not a secret document, mm -hmm. um, but it's just right now it's sort of preliminary and draft. So that's why we just sent it to you. Um, OK, so OK, another theme that's very that came out very strongly in our discussions is that um, autism is an unprecedented crisis. Um, as we know, the CDC has found a rate of approximately 2.3% of US eight-year-olds have autism. About 60% of those children have borderline or significant intellectual disability. Um, in, here in California, where I am now, um, we keep remarkably good records um, about autism in our De Department of Developmental Services system. Our caseload um, in that system, which only accepts those with substantially disabling developmental disability, right? It excludes those who are who are high functioning and independent, um, even those who are, very, you know, it excludes people who I, who I think are not very independent too. Um, the caseload has skyrocketed 50 fold over the past 35 years from about 3000 cases to about 158,000 cases today. This is not a subtle increase. Um, this is a massive, overwhelming, very obvious increase in very, very serious disability. Um, we've seen that areas of New Jersey are, have upwards of 5% um, eight, of eight-year-olds have autism. Um, there, we know that there is one, is it one school district? 12% of all the boys in that New Jersey school district have autism. These are very, very high numbers. Um, so... Bottom line, though once a rare disorder, seldom seen in clinics or even in institutions, autism now touches nearly every family in America today. Um, and one thing that's really critical and I think is underappreciated in the, in the autism advocacy world is, you know, if you go to developmental disability services systems, they were, they were really geared towards those with like Down syndrome, um, cerebral palsy, um, epilepsy and, you know, other kind of rare genetic disorders or kind of early traumatic brain injury. Um, and there was very little autism in those systems. And what's sort of interesting about those sort of older, more prevalent um, DDs is that these individuals often would not outlive their parents. What's different about the autism population is our kids will by and large outlive us. Our kids are by and large are quite healthy. And um, this makes this very much an unprecedented crisis. Our, our DD systems are really not equipped to deal um, with this new reality. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Okay, you guys are gonna hate the next couple slides because they're just packed with, <laughs> with verbiage and I hate verbiage slides. And my, my goal is here is not to lecture you. We're gonna go to Q and A and discussion fairly shortly, but just to show you how much we have on our plate, really. So you know, when we say like, oh my God, where do we even start? It's sometimes pretty hard when you look at all the things that we are facing. So at the federal level, here's the first slide. And I'm not gonna go over these, but you know, the big kahuna, you guys know this, the big issue is um, CMS funding or you know, Centers for uh, Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services funding. That's the primary funding source for our children's adult services, not so much for their children's services because that's covered by IDEA and that's a separate budget item. Um, so that's a really big target, making sure that this money is spent well on our population is a giant goal. Um, 
And, uh, and as we know, the wait list to even get those services is a, a huge catastrophe. So, you know, we could just spend all of our time on that and not do anything else, frankly, but I want to go over like how many other things there are. Um, you know, housing subsidies is a big deal for our population. Our population, of course, can't afford their own housing. Um, immigration is an issue at the federal level because frankly, uh, the direct support provider workforce is often, uh, often comes from immigrant communities. Um, the NIH is the biggest funder of autism research. Um, and uh, that comes primarily through what's called the Autism Cares Act, which will be undergoing reauthorization, I believe next year. Um, the Cares Act is what authorizes the IACC which many of you guys will, will know about and maybe lament about since it seems to be sort of um, consistently skirting issues that are important to our population. Um, Department of Education, of course, IDEA, which is a very big deal for our children. CDC uh, monitors autism prevalence um, and hopefully we'll be doing other research as well. You know, military, uh, a lot of you guys know, uh, are, are, are really dependent on TRICARE. Military also funds a lot of autism research. Um, Social Security, you know, does provide uh, monthly checks to adults and sometimes children um, to um, help pay for their expenses. Department of Labor um, can govern uh, rules around um, work programs. We know that 14C, which was the uh, non-competitive employment or still is the non-competitive employment provision in federal law is and is under attack. Um, everybody has to be in competitive and integrated employment. And of course, that's impossible for like 99% of our population. Um, the administration on community living um, is often the, uh, the kind of effectuator of um, federal policy and um, the ACL has a strong bent towards neurodiversity and away from serious um, neurodevelopmental disability. Um, another federal uh, role is the ABLE Act, um, which is a tax preferred savings plan for people with disabilities. Um, and a huge issue is uh, the federally funded DD advocacy world, the state councils on developmental disability, the disability rights organizations. Um, oh, there, there are many, uh, I can't even list them all. And um, again, um, they are staffed primarily with people with a strong neuro, uh, neurodiversity bent now. And again, sort of trending away from you know, some of the more serious issues that affect um, families and individuals like ours. Um, there are also federal advisory committees, um, the President's Council for Pe on People with Intellectual Disability, National Council on Disability, there are others. All right, uh, at the state and local level, um, again, the states are the ones who implement all that CMS funding, all the HCBS funding, um, the ICFs, um, the day programs, et cetera. Um, they fund often early inter intervention, um, although also that's, as we now, uh, mostly covered by insurance. Um, and when it comes to insurance, there are still a lot of important issues for us. Private insurance does cover things like ABA and to some extent, some adolescent and adult um, care as well. And um, mental health parity is I think a, will be a, a very important issue for us to make sure that the care that our children need, especially crisis care, hospital care um, is covered. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, Inpatient programs, um, by the way, you know, they're huge wait, wait lists to get into a place like Kennedy Krieger. A lot of our families have kids who are suffering really severe crisis. Um, and, um, you know, then they try to get the parents try to get a placement and they'll say, well, wait a year, you know, and the parents can't can't do that. And so they go to the hospital and they're in the ER and then the ER, oh, you guys are, I'm preaching to the choir here. And then the ER is like, well, we have nowhere to put your your person. And so they might be in the ER kind of chained, like literally, like in the ER for months on end. It's really a disaster. So that alone, right, could, could be one of our major goals and it would take a, a lot of effort. The waitlist crisis um, to get onto certain state Medicaid programs, um, the DSP crisis, the direct support provider crisis is huge um, everywhere. I mean, it's a huge thing here in California. I, I can say just from my personal experience, 
not a single agency um, would take my son, not only because of his behaviors, but because they can't hire staff who are capable of working with kids like him or adults like him. He's 23. Um, housing, of course, is a huge issue at the state level. I mean, the federal government does some subsidy work, but ultimately it's the state and local governments um, and, the, and the housing authorities um, that can put those into practice. Guardianship, huge issue. Guardianship is really important for us. Our kids and our adults need the strongest legal protections after they uh, become, after they turn 18, right? Or they become legal adults. Uh, but as we know, guardianship has been under attack um, by uh, many people in the disability advocacy world. I think that it's completely nonsensical. I'm all for alternatives to guardianship. When somebody has the cognitive capacity to delegate that, that authority, but in our case, they, our kids can't delegate that authority. So we definitely need to make sure that they have the strongest possible legal protections by those who know and love them. Um, and uh, of course, uh, police safety emergency preparedness is another huge issue at the state and local level. I don't have to lecture you about that. Now, <laughs> see, we're not done. See, I told you you hate these slides. It just goes on and on. You know, the, the amount of things that we can spend our time doing truly boggles the mind. Um, you know, science research and clinical issues. Um, you know, I, I believe very strongly that um, we have stalled on our hunt for risk factors for autism. We have found really precious little to explain the increase in autism or to inform families about how to reduce the risk of autism in, in offspring. So I believe that that should be a priority. Um, research on diagnostics and subtypes. Okay, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? You guys already know what a hot mess the DSM is, right? By mushing so many different um, really clinical realities into the ASD umbrella. Um, you know, we have definitely taken a strong position that the current state of the, the DSM-5 is inadequate and actually subverts the needs of, of you know, children like ours. Um, but you know, moving that needle is not easy and will we'll take time and um, you know, more research and more um, I don't know, shining a light on, on the problems involved in that. Um, treatment, it, giant issue. I mean, giant, giant, giant issue. I mean, if, if there's one wish that autism families, or at least severe autism families can be granted is they want the challenging behaviors to go away because the challenging behaviors so profoundly impair quality of life for the individual who is affected and their family members. So we are extremely supportive of um, treatment, um, you know, research on treatments that can improve um, functioning and quality of life. Um, research on prevalence is a big, big, big deal. It's sort of amazing. Like I just told you that autism has increased 50 fold in um, the California Department of Developmental Services system. But there's almost no research projecting actual needs based on this curve, right? This incredible skyrocketing um, curve. So I think that uh, we definitely need more research to project future needs so that our policies can be, we can be prepared, right? rather than having kids crowding ERs who are ill-equipped to deal with them. Um, treatment access is a very big deal, very, very big deal. Um, we are definitely lacking clinicians. Uh, of course, we know this, this is across psychiatry. It's not just in autism, across mental health. We don't have enough providers. We don't have, have enough caregivers. Uh, we definitely need to reduce disparities to ensure access regardless of you know, ethnic, or socioeconomic background. Um, we definitely need more clinicians to be aware of underlying comorbid mental health and other health conditions that might be driving the behaviors um, and, uh, and distress. Um, expanding access to treatments that do in fact benefit some in our population. For example, ECT, which Amy has written about, and she's been a leader on, on that particular topic, you know, people say that's electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and I don't want to belabor this too much. Um, people say, oh, you know, you're torturing your child by subjecting them to ECT. Well, I mean, 
no one wants to do this to their child, as we know. But you know what? What we have to do as advocates is explain that there is a subpopulation for whom certain alternatives might be really vital. Right? We're not trying to prescribe it for everybody with autism. We're trying to say, hey, we're calling out this population. We're important too. Um, you know, we need more, uh, obviously reimbursement rates are a huge issue that um, are dragging down um, uh, appropriate provision of services. Um, I, I, I can go through all of these, but you know, we need training, we need curricula, we need um, standards of care um, so that you know, insurance companies might reimburse because there are standards and there's medical necessity. Um, and we also need to reduce fraudulent practices. Um, we are, unfortunately, autism is just like a minefield of nutty stuff. And it has been for a very long time. It continues to be. And there are fraudulent practices, a lot of non-validated communication um, interventions, a lot of non-evidence-based treatments. I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue those. I think you know, new ideas are often good. They just have to be subjected to research. They have to be subjected to um, observation and validation. That's all. And right now that's not happening in a lot of places. Any comments on this before I go on? I know everyone hates these slides. <laughs> okay. All right, we're running a little short on time, so I will continue. Other, okay, <laughs> see, it doesn't end. It just goes on. Um, Autism Awareness Month. Um, our focus has been on promoting authentic awareness in April instead of portraying autism as something maybe it's not in our population. We'll probably continue to do that. Um, INSAR is the big international society for autism research. Um, it, like everybody else, you know, it's kind of taken this uh, pendulum swing strongly towards neurodiversity themes and away from themes that are important to our population. So uh, some of us, for example, we did um, a, 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 a workshop, a special interest group at the last year's conference or this year's conference. Um, and, um, you know, having a voice, making sure that severe autism is on the radar and is a very central focus for that organization is important to us. Um, language and representation, of course, there's so much language policing. We kind of talked about that. And I know you guys are experiencing that as well. We support realistic portrayals of severe autism. We don't feel like, you know, only certain types of autism, you know, deserve to be on the stage. We believe all types of autism deserve to be on the stage. Um, the September 26th project is an emergency preparedness effort um, that we sponsor. Um, that's in honor of our late founding VP, Feda Al Malidi, um, and her son, Mohammed, who perished in a house fire in 2020 on September 26th. And um, that's just an annual effort to promote emergency preparedness among autism families. And so that will continue. Um, technology is another thing. Um, we're really interested in improving technology that, that can improve the health and well being and quality of life um, for our population. Um, and really important, uh, ensuring that parent and family advocacy is really at the forefront for this population. Um, there are those who try to delegitimize um, parent voices, which I think is crazy. <laughs> um, and we just want to make sure that our voices are heard. Okay, Leanne is gonna take it away for almost the rest of the meeting. All right, we're gonna run a poll. The answers are anonymous um, for these, just so everyone knows, but I'm gonna launch the first poll and we're trying to get a feel for what everybody's um, uh, most uh, critical issue is to you. So we have, if you wouldn't mind, giving us a feel. And we might do some more, um, more formal surveys in the future, but I just thought this might be interesting for right now to get a feel. And uh, these are a lot of the issues that Jill just covered. So let me see. No. Is everybody seeing the results? I'm not sure if everybody I'm, can see Yeah, that. I'm seeing them, okay. yeah. Housing and behavior. 
Well, there's a clear front runner. <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay. Long term, right? That's what none of all of us want to live forever. That's that's yeah. the thing, okay. right? So. <laughs> so our precincts have reported, and everyone can see this, Leanne, right? Yes. Okay. Our precincts are reporting um, <laughs> a landslide victory for um, long-term care and supervision, including housing. Um, our oh, they're up. saying, you know what? I think only us can see them. So, oh, okay. So then Leanne, now we got the report. To, ah, I don't, I don't um, know how to. Yeah, this is the part where I have to figure out. So um, until I can, how do I show the results? We could just report it out, I think. Yeah. For a yeah. So basically, everybody, just so you know, 61% um, of you uh, said that long term care and supervision, including housing, um, were share the poll. Someone's letting me do was definitely the, the distinct winner at 61%, with a 26% uh, saying um, treatment and management of challenging behavior is, is another, um, is the next critical issue for you. And a couple of the comments I'm reading, they're saying that you know they had a hard time deciding between those two things. So, um, so obviously, you know, I think, you know, a lot of us parents are thinking the same things that way. So, all right. Oh, now I can share results. There we go. So, do people okay. see it now? Hopefully, everybody can see it now. Yep. Yeah, very is good. I yes. guess I had to wait for all the votes to come and, in. And so. yeah, someone said two sides of the same coin. And I would tend to agree with that. That's right. When you reduce challenging behavior, you open up a whole lot of mm -hmm. options for longer for long term care. All good right. point. Okay, now to our next poll. Let's see. Oh, sorry. I can. And uh, these are. Um, this is multiple choice, or this is, you can choose more than one, but we're trying to get a feel for what people are comfortable with, with um, doing advocacy. So this isn't necessarily what you have experience doing, but what you think you'd be comfortable and willing to do. Um, and emailing, you know, we'll probably have some form emails um, and calling, attending meetings, um, you know, the research has shown for, for grassroots networks that visiting face to face is probably makes the biggest impact out of everything but recent research is also showing that our social media that our representatives are using it and looking at it so um in light in, in light of what's going on with twitter and what we don't know is going to happen with twitter i think that's interesting um but it might behoove some of us to get a little bit more twitter familiar and um and that might be something that we're uh uh, going to ask for folks to do. So I'm going to give people a few, just a few more seconds to answer and I'll show the results. Um, but I thought that was very interesting. I, I didn't realize until I did some research that, um, yes, they are, our representatives do have people on their staff that are monitoring social media um, for these things. So I'm going to end the poll. And there we go. So that's great. So it seems like a lot of folks are, we have some interest in doing all sorts of different activities this way. And what I'm hoping to do in the future is, is do a little bit of a presentation on um, how to do effective advocacy. So that's one of the things I'd like to spearhead. And, and, um, and for people who don't have experience, um, you know, we, we don't want to just say, go do this. We wanna help guide you through that. So, um, and if we have any experienced advocates out there, um, you know, we welcome your input to that as well. So um, just let us know your interest in, in doing those things. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, so um, as we move forward, um, we will be creating um oh gosh let's see hold on how do i get this off sorry 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 stop sharing let's see oh hold on i can't see anything because the poll's in the way do you have a way to remove the poll leanne or i thought i turned it off okay well oh hold on let me get rid of it sorry 
it's no big deal. I, I, I can still go on. It's not like I need to read anything. Um, so um, as I said, uh, you know, we, we will be producing materials over time. Right now, we do not have a library of materials beyond what you see in on our website, again, under position statements, NCSA position statements. Those are public statements about you know, what we believe on certain topics. Um, we don't have other materials prepared yet, but we will be kind of converting this backgrounder with all that stuff, all that brain dump stuff I just went over. Those will turn into, um, um, you know, actually uh, kind of a living documents that will change over time and be constantly updated and that can be used by advocates. We will create leave behinds, right? So when you have a meeting or you're emailing somebody, there's something you know, visually appealing that summarizes our, our position on a particular topic. Um, we'll create infographics. I just stole this lovely infographic from one of our members, um, Michelle McFarland McDaniels in Illinois, who has an incredible new nonprofit that she's forming called Thrive Enrichment Services. Um, and, um, you know, we will be creating these kinds of things over time. Um, and uh, videos as well. And I think we are, we don't have enough time, unfortunately, to show it. We do on our homepage have one advocacy video, which is really to bring to light realities of severe autism. Gloria, I think it's like seven minutes, right? Mm, I think it's, yeah, like six and change. Yeah, okay. So it's not too long. And you, you can find that. And that's something, if you're in a meeting with somebody or you want somebody to understand, uh, what severe autism can look like, you can point to that, but hopefully we'll, we'll be developing more materials um, like that. Okay, um, what can you, so while, you know, obviously we're not running out the gate with like, you know, giving you marching orders right now, we're obviously not doing that, but what are some things you can do? Um, you can ask friends to join our network. Um, you can get a Twitter account. Because um, as we know, these people do monitor Twitter for better or worse. Um, and I did already see that 36% of you are willing to post on social media. <laughs> so that's a good number um, to get on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Frankly, I don't tweet a lot about NCSA related stuff. I, I'm on it for other reasons, but I, I will try to up my game in that regard. Um, you know, find out who, who your congr congressional representative is you know, send them a card, right? Tell them your story. You just start a relationship um, because hopefully we'll be able to build that relationship over time. And you can also share your story with us at NCSA. We love publishing people's stories, whether it's on Facebook or on our blog in our newsletter or otherwise. It doesn't even have to have your name on it. We, we, we defer to people's preference if they wanna be anonymous, if they wanna use a pseudonym, doesn't matter. Um, you know, share, sharing stories is always a good thing. Um, okay, so with that, oh, oh, okay, I'm gonna just stop share. With that, we have like one minute, but we'll do a few minutes uh, for, um, let's see, oh, now I can see, now I can see um, for discussion and Q and A. Uh, Gloria, somebody said that video was excellent. The, the voice for severe autism on our homepage. Um, someone says uh, one pagers are critical for leave behinds and getting sign ons from other organizations and individuals fact sheets. Yes, and I, I think that obviously these are things that we will be developing over time um, as our issues come into better focus. Uh, someone says our position statements are excellent. Thank you, I agree. Um, I think we still have to revise our housing position statement. We'll work on that early next year. Um, please provide us a link to this presentation. Um, do you mean this presentation? We are recording this. So everyone will get a link to this recording if that's what you mean. Um, let's see, I have tried multiple times over years in applying to state advisory councils, but never selected, probably due to my advocacy um, for state ICFs. Um, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, getting a seat at the table is sort of what we're all about, but people don't want to hear, often don't want to hear our voice. I mean, you know, nobody wants to hear kind of the, the tougher realities out there and the need for programs. Um, but
but you know, uh, I, I don't think it's a lost cause at all, at all. Um, okay. Okay, I think they mean the slides. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint slide deck? Sure. Yeah, we can provide that as well. No problem. Okay, so um, it, with like two more minutes, if you want to put something in the chat with any comments or questions, how can we contact Leanne? Leanne. Thinking about that, um, I'm going to give everybody. I, I have a, my personal email address, and I'm just. I just realized I was trying to make a subset of that before. To post to everyone so that everybody could go to like a subset email. But I'm just going to give everyone my personal one. If you could do me a favor um, and just put NCSA in the uh, subject line, um, so that will help me um, keep it separate from my 26,000 other messages currently residing in my inbox. And I wish I was kidding. Um, so uh, I'm going to provide that through chat right now. And I did generate a new QR code that should work for everyone. Um, and I'll make sure that that gets updated in the PowerPoint presentations before Jill distributes that. Um, I see we have a whole bunch of folks that have um, done their request in the Facebook group. So I'm gonna be going and vetting everyone. Um, I wanna make sure we're all protected. So I am gonna be checking against our NGN spreadsheet information. So if I contact you, um, uh, you know, there might be a discrepancy in the email that you provided. Um, and if you if you happen to be on this and you have not actually officially registered into our NGN, um, please do so through our website so that we make sure that you're accounted for. Um, yeah, that definitely, way. definitely. Um, okay, a few more, quick, let's go through some of these pretty quickly. Um, is the NGN policy background or PDF doc shareable outside of the network, the eight page doc created or dated December? Um, you know, that was sort of draft. Uh, I'd prefer it if you did not share it. Um, what I plan to do is put it into another revision and then post it on our website and then it will be completely shareable. So if you could just hold your horses on that, um, it just needs some cleaning up. It's not gonna be a major revision at all. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question. Um, let's see, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, oh my goodness. Hugo, shout out to Hugo. <laughs> Isn't there an autism caucus? There is an autism caucus. Um, there's also sometimes at the state level as well, not just federal. Um, from what I can tell, and I am not an advocacy maven at all, but it's been pretty quiet. I don't think it's been very meaningful lately. But I do know, you know, there are obviously a lot of people in Congress who are very interested in this issue. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously knowing who those people are is, is going to be important. I think we know who some of them are. Somebody mentioned, like, do we know who the, the federal legislators are who really matter um, on this? And the, that answer is some, and this is why we need the network, right? We, we need to find out who really are our allies. Um, and this is also why we need a policy chair people. <laughs> So the policy chair, um, you know, will be really uh, much more alert about the, um, the makeup of those politicians. Um, okay, uh, yes, keep applying, seat at the table is crucial. If you're not at the table, you are on the menu. That is so true, <laughs> yes. We definitely so there's, there's another um, post that talks about whether or not writing op-eds would be an option. And I think it's great to emphasize the more publicity, the better. Um, and, you know, ghost writers, whatever, you know, we can help with that, I think, as well. But yes, uh, always getting it out there in the press is huge. It's very, very difficult, though. So, like, if people have contacts and at any big media sources, that would be awesome because that's something we run into all the time, just trying to get, um, you know, newspapers and big platforms to pick up these stories. I'm dealing with that right now. And uh, it's hard. You you can be, um, you know, it's just, it's just really hard. So if you happen to figure it out or know somebody that's like really happy to help. I don't know. I, I'm going to say something. I've seen more and more not just news coverage of um, you know stories about severe autism, but also kind of editorial um, matter about 
about severe autism. Uh, maybe it's just that, um, you know, people are sending it more to me, you know, um, uh, but I, I, I don't think it's impossible. I mean, even NCSA has had a couple letters printed in the New York Times. Um, uh, you know, some of our people on our board have had high profile pieces published. It's definitely not impossible at all. Um, I think people do do care, but there is a certain, especially with certain publications, an ideological wall, <laughs> and getting over that ideological wall is sometimes not not easy. I agree with Amy on on that. Um, okay, a few more guys, and help me with some uh, questions here. Um, okay, uh, da, 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 da. sorry. On the federal level, it is all about the committees they sit on. Exactly. That is where legislation gets built. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've actually been tracking um, a couple of the committees and where we have people. So, um, yeah. you know, when we get into the weeds at some point, I can talk to people about that a little bit more. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is not this meeting today is not too much getting into the weeds. It's really meant to be an introduction. But what you're saying is um, is completely right. Minnesota has a huge budget surplus and a horrible DSP crisis. Not a single word was said to the press about prioritizing people with disabilities. Um, I think that's not just the DSP crisis is everywhere. But yeah, that budget surplus should be a priority and this is why we need people to mobilize. Um, neither my senators or my congressman has anything to say about disability on their websites. This is an area that could be beneficial to getting our message out. Yeah, you know, I, I want to say something about this, which is I marvel at politics and what becomes a priority issue and what doesn't become a priority issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to like any presidential debate, any vice presidential debate, any almost a congressional like debate, and you will see no one talking about autism. It's almost like people are like, oh, we've kind of accepted the neurodiversity narrative that autism's always been here and we're just counting it better and we're just celebrating neurodiversity. It's like this issue, you know, the increase in very serious neurodevelopmental disability among children. Again, we're seeing, we're, we're very soon gonna be at 3% of all children, right, with autism. And that doesn't even count those right, who are you know, diagnosed later and in adulthood. I, and and it seems like it's just off the radar, and this is a big issue. And it's it's it would take a Herculean effort to get it back on the radar. I think it was on the radar for a while, right? When there was a strong uptick in cases, and no one understood why. Well, now we have a five thousand percent increase in California, and no one seems to care. It's a crazy, absurd fact of our uh, of our world. Okay, maybe a few more, and then we're gonna have to call it quits. Anybody else want to comment on some? Comments. Housing and long term care seem to be the highest priority, perhaps a focus on this and making sure that every state has options for adequately funded high quality options for long term congregate care. Um, maybe not, con not you know, congregates right for some people, not not for other people. Um, yeah, so there's somebody saying don't agree, don't agree about congregate care again. Our position is what's best for the individual. We aren't for one model or against another model. We're for what's work, what works for individuals. Um, but yeah, I mean, what Danny said is is right. I mean, we every state needs to have options for adequately funded, um, high quality care, no matter what the setting is. That's absolutely. Yeah, I think it's I think it's important to address the sorry, you know, um, the comment. I don't agree with con congregate care. Um, and it's not about agreeing or disagreeing. It's about what exactly, as you said, Jill, right? There is a spectrum of needs. There's a continuum of care that is necessary. I mean, we have congregate care for our elderly. You know, we have even, you know, locked communities for individuals with, you know, severe Alzheimer's um, uh, disease. And we're looking at quality of care. We're looking at not sticks and bricks or locations. We're looking at what is a quality of life? What is the quality of care that is delivered and what is appropriate? So it's a choice mandate. It's not, you know, inclusion ideology or one, uh, ex one um, niche or another. It's, it's what is appropriate, I think needs to be the yeah. assessment. 
Yeah, and I want to say, like, you know, in the group, even on our board, and we don't all agree on everything, right? We don't. And that's going to be true here. There will be internal disagreements um, about, you know, policies. Um, but again, you know, we, we are guided by our, our person-centered ethos. And, um, you know, I, I'm not here to overrule somebody else's reality and somebody else's needs. Um, okay, uh, range of choices is important. Yep, definitely range of choices. We're all about that. The elderly have multiple options. Our kids should have multiple options too, for sure. We need to make sure all states know that the need and demand for long-term care will certainly increase dramatically over the next few decades. Absolutely, because of the increase in birth prevalence of those already diagnosed. That's absolutely true. And I think it's a very underreported um, um, topic for our country. Um, uh, okay, somebody wants to talk to Don. Don, Jennifer wants to talk to you. Um, Together for Choice is an organization to possibly partner with for housing. Yes, Together for Choice is definitely um, one of the like-minded organizations that we have actually already partnered with in the past, and we will continue to do so. Um, Gloria, well said. I'm for what's best. We need a group setting for accountability. We need safety for our son. That's very true. We need options. HCBS may not work for everyone. That's true. Um, okay. Boy, thank you for all these comments, people. Um, yeah, if we don't address the DSP workforce crisis, we won't have any options. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. I mean, I'd love to say that, you know, parents and family members are going to live forever and take care of our kids, but um, biology is biology and, and we are quite terminal. Um, and uh, we definitely need a strong DSP workforce. Um, and uh, and that's not only for us. I mean, we see this crisis outside of autism as well. Okay, so um, I'm afraid we are well past our time, but there were so many good things to talk about. Um, any any uh, panelists, would you like to have any closing comments? Amy. No, I just wanna say I'm so excited for to see everybody here. So many familiar faces, no, sorry, faces, names, and uh, so many names I don't recognize. And uh, I really do. I've always believed that uh, the reason why, um, you know, the other side, for lack of a better word, is winning is because they're so organized and um, able to get to legislators and, and impress upon them, you know, how they feel. And I think this is kind of the first step for us kind of becoming organized and becoming a stronger, united voice. Thanks, Amy. Gloria, last words? As usual, I can't say it any better than Amy has said. I mean, um, you know, kudos to Jill, really, for sure, in developing NCSA and then taking it to the next level. It wasn't a, just me. Yeah. yeah, well, no, I know you have a team, but your leadership really is inspiring and we're grateful for that. Um, taking it to the next level at a grassroots effort um, is, is huge. Um, the Autism uh, Law Summit was able to push. It took 10, 12, I don't really remember how many years to get um, insurance reform. And, you know, our FEDA was involved in that um, for many years, but they did it every single state, right? So now this is our form of that. And you're already half, over halfway there in terms of legislative districts represented. And, and that's what it takes. It takes getting uh, FaceTime uh, with our legislators, use the video, uh, if you haven't seen it, please go and see it because I think you can use it. Um, and this is, as Jill said, just the first step in, in you said it's a long journey. I think we're going to get there really fast. Oh, okay, Gloria. <laughs> well, I'm glad you think so. Um, Leanne, final words. Uh, I just want to thank all our participants. Um, this is hard to get to meetings. I mean, that's, that's in itself is um, just so great that um, y'all came tonight and uh, so many of you are interested in getting involved. I just, we're very appreciative of your interest and we we wanna support you um, in supporting us. So thank you again. And um, my email was in the chat. So I know there were a few questions about what congressional districts are not covered. I can provide that information to folks. Um, so feel free to uh, contact me 
Um, and maybe we can even add in my email to um, the PowerPoint slides if you're gonna send those out. Um, but thank you everyone again. Thank you, Jill um, and Amy and Gloria for um, including me um, in these efforts. I'm very excited about what can happen. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Um, we will have a follow-up newsletter um, with all the various links um, and the link to this recording as well. Um, so stay tuned for that. And in 2023, we will meet again. Um, so um, maybe not as a whole, maybe it'll be smaller groups. Um, so stay tuned for that as well. And I wish everybody happy holidays. Okay, signing off everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.